everyone who joins in today. I want to welcome Emma Viskic. Um, Emma is critically acclaimed. Caleb, is it Zalek? I forgot to check. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, novels have been published worldwide. The series has won numerous awards, including a Ned Kelly Award and an unprecedented five David Awards. Her debut novel, Resurrection Bay, was shortlisted for the UK's prestigious Gold Dagger Award and New Blood Award and a Barry Award in the US. The third novel in the series, Darkness for Light, is currently nominated for a Barry Award. And formerly a classical musician, Emma's musical career ranged from performing with Jose Carreras to playing at an engagement party that ended in a brawl. Emma also learned Aslan in order to create the character of Caleb, who was profoundly deaf, and her fourth novel in the series, Those Who Perish, will be out early 2022. So thanks so much for joining us, Emma. Um, just want to mention I read Resurrection by, if it lets me share it, yep, just recently and really enjoyed it. Um, I can see that it would be a really good series to be reading. Um, would you like to share some more about your books to everyone? Yeah, thanks, Jackie. Um, yeah, so as you said, it's a, it's a series. Uh, they're crime novels. Um, described lots of different ways by lots of different people. Um, so it's probably the easiest thing to say is that they're contemporary, they're modern, they're not historical. Mm. And they're set between Melbourne and and a, a fictional, I'm going to say fictional, it is fictional, but it's drawing on a lot of places, a uh, mm. coastal town in Victoria. And um, the my hero is Caleb Zellick, who is, as you said, profoundly deaf. Um, and, and Resurrection Bay starts absolutely no spoilers because it's in the first sentence resurrection bay begins where um he is sitting in a, a kitchen the mate's kitchen holding his best mate's dead body mm. and his his mate has been brutally murdered and then we go on to find out is caleb the bad guy is he the good guy mm. what is his place in this story um and and that's pretty much how I read it, uh, how I wrote it as well mm. with that that first image in my mind, and then to discover who these who these people were. So so when you wrote that first book, did you know they were going to be a series? Oh well, as much as I thought um, it would be published, which I didn't, mm. <laughs> I had sort of been this. You've got to be in two minds when you write your first book, which is that it will never be published, and that is fine, and you've got to just sit with that and just be fine with it. And then the other part of your brain has got to go, every single enemy I've ever made is going to read this book. <laughs> <laughs> and somewhere in the middle of there is a, is a, is a sweet spot where you're going to mm. do it. So I had imagined that um, it was going to be a short series. And by short, um, I mean somewhere between three and five, six books. Um, mainly because the characters change a lot through the books and, and Caleb himself I want to take him on a journey. He, mm. he starts off as being this really very isolated person. He's, he's got a lot of barriers up um, in, in some ways because of his deafness, because he's not quite part of the deaf community, he's not quite part of the hearing community, he's somewhere in the middle, but mainly because of his personality and because of his upbringing, mm. he pushes people away. So I really wanted to change him and put him under pressure over the different books and, and see how he reacted um to pressure and also to happiness whether he'd accept it you can't keep having um big things happen to a character who's changing like that yeah over 20 30 40 50 books you know mm. it's not a jack reacher it's almost mm. an anti-jack reacher so yeah i sort of went into it going all right it'll be it'll be a finite number of books now i'm coming to the last one in the series for the last couple of years i've been feeling quite sad about it actually yeah. I've, I've got i've got a lot more i want to do with him and mm. i could just keep going but it felt like it, it had an actual arc to it. So it, mentally I've gone, well, the next book will be the end of this series. I'll go and write some other things. And if I f still feel that urge, I can do a jump in time 
taking to another, you know, part in his life and, and just do another short series. Yeah. So with that in my mind, I'm now able to go, <laughs> happy go to Parish. will be the last in this series. Yeah. 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 So you're mm. happy to leave him for the moment. And, no, no, it's, it's yeah. an au revoir. It's a, mm. yeah, yeah. See you later, mate. We'll mm. see what happens. Yeah. Mm. yeah. And a deaf character, what brought you to want to have your character to be deaf? Uh, uh, I didn't. I really, really didn't. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And it's one of those um, interesting things in writing. Sometimes the things that you're most scared of end up being the best thing you could possibly do. Mm. But it was quite a journey mm. for me to do it. Um, look, the, the, the inspiration actually I only worked out afterwards. And it, it's from a few areas of my life. I, I thought it was partly because I had gone to school with a deaf girl. I met her, you know, nine, ten, that age when you're really starting to go, other people have got different lives. How mm. fascinating is that? Mm. But it was a lot deeper in that um, I only had paternal grandparents, not maternal grandparents. Um, they didn't speak English. They were oh. Croatian immigrants. Mm. I was not raised, raised to speak Croatian. So there was that missing chunk of my family not being able to communicate with them and also seeing how isolated they were but also happy they were in their little enclave so mm. that's just been there i kept writing stories about outsiders you know every primary school blind man you know an invisible girl mm. someone who's mute. Okay. so it's all that sort of stuff in there um probably partly my personality as well with mm. weird child you know not quite fitting in at school um adhd so like i'm, I'm a girl you know staring out the window <laughs> so it's all of those sort of outsider tropes yeah but as i say that came after i wrote the book that i worked that all out the actual <laughs> writing of the book was me going he's deaf he's definitely deaf that is too hard to write i cannot do that mm. um technically um and also what are the responsibilities that come from writing outside your own um, experiences. Um, Caleb is not a representative of the deaf community or anyone who's deaf or hard of hearing, but he could be read like that. Mm. So it took me months and months to get my head around doing it, but he's one of those characters who kept going, come on, come on, write me, write me. So that's when I started, you know, uh, you know it took me like five years of, re uh, I, don't, I don't like the word research, uh, mm. immersing myself, mm. you know, I, talking to, to deaf and hard of hearing people mm. and learning Auslan and um, and just going around with earbuds in my ears and trying to lip read. Mm. You know, I did a lip reading course, terrible, terrible at it. <laughs> so it was this really long journey. Um, it's been fa they're fantastic though. It's been uh, mm. really, really eye-opening for me, I think, yeah, mm. as a person and a, and a writer. Mm. And what sort of response did you get from the deaf community? Yeah, well, so far really great. Mm. I mean, um, I think whenever you put yourself out into the world, you've got to accept that you will get negative criticism. I, I assume it will happen to my face at some stage. Mm. Um, but no, it's, it's been really, really positive and lovely um, so far. <laughs> mm. Yeah. And in your intro, we said that you were a classical musician. What um, what instrument, was it an instrument you were? Yeah, yeah. I'm a clarinet player. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and yeah. what makes a classical musician want to become a writer? Is that something you'd always wanted to be before? Or? Yeah, it's been quite similar in my brain. Um, so I was a writer first. Uh, I wrote ever since I could read, you mm -hmm. know, four or five years old. Um, hours were just immersed in, in, in writing. So that was always there. Um, and then I think the music sort of, I think perhaps felt like a bit of a more practical way to sort of put my energies. So it took over more and more. Um, <laughs> I could tell you being a classical musician, particularly, I, I mean, I sort of, uh, it, I, was, um, I played orchestral stuff, played orchestras, mm. uh, operas and things, but I really concentrated and loved chamber music, little tiny groups. Got to tell you, not a, not a great career, you know, path in Australia. Mm. <laughs> so it wasn't that practical a thing, mm. but I did love it. I really, really did love it, but, but I, I miss writing more. Mm. So it was a matter of they sort of came, they diverged, and then I went back to writing, really. Mm. But, but they're, they're, they're very similar in my brain, though. Um, they, they take up the same sort of space in my brain, I think. Yeah. Mm. Mm. 
And could you tell us a little bit about what, like you said, you did some research with immersing with um, in the community and that with hard of hearing people and deaf people. What other research did you do for your book? So uh, I think that was probably the the bulk of it mm. was talking to people, listening to people, learning sign language. Um, as I said, I, I did an online lip reading course, which is I thought I was really clever. Um, but when I went out into the world with earbuds in and tried to catch trains mm. and order coffees and things, I, I, I realised um, how hard it was. But but also I learned a lot about other people's responses, mm. patronising or angry or irritated, things that I had imagined but I hadn't quite felt, you know. It, it's that I think you can know something intellectually but a, a lot of writing is about empathy and not writing about your characters but being your characters and that's how you make that emotional connection with the reader on the page mm. you know so so you're not narrating something you're actually experiencing it for me anyway i don't think it's the same for all writers but i think there's a there's a there's an element of that um in 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 terms of like the the technical aspect of thing I, I read i read a lot of stuff as well i mean i read biographies and a lot of blogs there's a lot of blogs out there i'm on a lot of facebook groups still with uh deaf and hard of hearing people and and also coders you know um children of deaf adults so that's a really interesting aspect as well mm. so uh yeah all that stuff mm. and on the crime side of things because they are crime novels Talking to police, actually, um, I find that if you, if you, it, it's getting harder and harder to talk to someone if you don't know them. They'll send you to the media department, but often if you ring a country town, and because my books are set in a country town, yeah. I will ring police stations in towns that are about the same size to just check that I've got the right number of, you know, patrol cars in the area, or um, what's the senior most cop in a town of. 3000 mm. so uh, i find picking up the phone as much as i hate talking on the phone is is actually a fantastic way of doing research yeah yeah and that first book that you got published how hard or easy was it to get that published um <laughs> any uh any aspiring writers out there are going to hate this answer in the end it was really easy mm. but it was weird it was a weird sort of series of events that led to it. I, I had finished writing Resurrection Bay um, and I was in that really polishing stage and I was thinking I'd send it out to um, agents or publishers in about three months or, or possibly never. And um, I had won a couple of short story prizes, the Thunderbolt and the Ned Kelly, they're both prime short writing, short story mm. writing prizes. I'd also been following a lot of publishers on Twitter and one of the publishers who I was quite interested in, I thought that could be a good match for me, put out a tweet one day saying, hey, guys, tell me what you're writing, you know? And I went, <laughs> so I spent like 12 hours crafting this really casual tweet reply. Mm -hmm. Hey, I won these short story prizes and I'm writing this book. And, it's, and she emailed me like within an hour and mm -hmm. said, I'd like to read the first three chapters. And she that was Resurrection Bay and she liked the first two chapters. So then she asked for the rest of it and, and it sort of just went on. And when I when I met her, that was um, Angela Meyer at Echo Publishing, I it, we felt like a really good match. Mm. So it happened. But if that hadn't happened, I don't know. Yeah. Could have ended up on the slush pile, never seen. Um, mm. It's one of those moments, sliding door moments, where mm. you have to be ready. You have to have the novel. I have to like it. But then there's that little element of luck and yeah. timing in there as well yeah being in the mm. right place at the right time mm. yeah mm. Mm. and did you have someone who really encouraged your writing i never showed to anyone okay. <laughs> no no yeah. no my little secret advice mm. really mm. uh so my husband got to read it after it was published oh wow <laughs> Um, yeah, so, uh, however, the, the very um, last draft of Resurrection Bay, I was lucky enough in that, well, and I, I'm so glad I did this, I made myself do this, I did apply for an on on online mentorship with, um, she's actually a, an editor in, um, mm. in Scotland. <laughs> oh. It was this great program set up um, to literary women, mentoring literary women, you know, if you couldn't afford 
mentorship or mm. a, you know a course or something um and so she helped me through the last draft and basically taught me to examine my work in a different way um she'd ask me questions every you know mm. what do you feel what are you trying to do in this scene would you like to go this way or that way and, and just really uh honed, honed my own eyes really it was mm -hmm. fantastic and how did you say you came about to connect with her? So I, I don't think it's running anymore, but it was a program in May again called the We Mentoring Project, okay. um, run by a UK writer Kerry so Hudson, and it was just a lot of just volunteers. You I just applied. Apply yeah, okay. you had to apply for it, and they yeah. had to choose you. So I did apply mm. for other people and didn't get it. Mm. Um, and as luck would have it, Jeanette Jeanette Curry, who's, who's um, my mentor, um, chose me. And I, I think she was absolutely the right person for me at the right time it, yeah, yeah. It made a difference yeah that sounds great um mm -hmm. we've got a few people watching so just reminding people watching if you have any questions for emma please type them in comments um kelly's wondering who your favorite character is in the caleb zalek books ha huh. it depends who i'm writing at the time <laughs> really so um caleb's um business partner frankie um, I really enjoy writing her character. She is an older woman. She's like 50. She, she ages a little bit, but she starts off to about 57, 58. And she's really snarky and mm. spiky. And I find her a really good foil for Caleb because Caleb's incredibly tough on the outside, but he's an absolute sook really inside. He's, he's very, you know, soft hearted. And so we've got that really sort of sharp banter that she she does with him. So I really enjoy that. Anytime, you know, I think that maybe it's getting a bit maudlin or soppy. Mm. Frankie can, you know, come in and say something really sharp. And I, I love doing that, you know, it's that mm. alter ego. I also really, I really, I do enjoy writing Caleb's character too, because he's got a dry sense of humour. But um, I love writing um, his mother-in-law, Maria, mm. who is uh, like the first Aboriginal doctor in their small town. And she um, she's brutal. She's mm. brutally honest um, and very straight down the line. And she's very much inspired by a lot of a lot of women I know. Um, so I, I've, I really enjoy getting inside uh, her character. Mm. Mm. Kelly said that um, she agrees Frankie's a fantastic character and she brings a lot to your novels. Oh, great. I'm oh, really mm. glad. Thanks, Kelly. Mm. <laughs> and I'm wondering what you like to read yourself and maybe if there's something you've been reading lately you'd like to recommend to us. Yeah, so I read pretty much everything. Mm. Um, everything except horror because I'm a sook. Um, it just scares me. Anything paranormal, yeah. you know, just freaks me out. Mm -hmm. um, it's really sad. Um, so I read anything. Funnily enough, when I'm at the end stages of writing a book, which I am at the moment, my edits are nearly due in, I read less crime at that stage because it, it um, can get in my head. I have written, I have read a couple of crime novels lately, though. Um, I've just started this one. In fact, this is an uncorrected proof. This is um, Margaret Hickey, Hickey's. Okay. Carter's End. So that's just coming out now. If it's if it's not out now, it'll be out very, very soon. I've only just started this and I'm really enjoying it. Um, and then this is this is actually not a novel. Southern Cross Crime okay. by Craig Sisterson. Um, I've been dipping into this one again. It's actually um, how, I don't even know how to explain it. It's basically a compendium to Australian crime writing. writing. So he's got a lot of information about Australian crime novels and television shows. He's mm. got interviews in there with writers. He's got rundown of all sorts of different characters and books and writers. So it's it's a really handy thing. Um, and I I just I was just part of the um, New England Rural Crime Writing um, Festival last weekend, mm. and and I've been through this book a lot. But I picked it up again to refresh my memory. And I, God, it's it's really thorough. Like it's not a huge book, but it's um it's got a lot in it. Um, and full disclosure, I'm in it too. So I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm <laughs> selling myself there, but it, it's, it's really handy. Mm. Um, and another old, it's an old one. It's an old favorite of mine, um, which is the monkey's mask, okay. uh, by Dorothy Porter. Mm. Um, love it. I think it's 1990s. It must've been published crime novel in verse. I mean, which sounds like a wank, but I'll go to you. It's a fantastic book and mm. it's funny. It's really funny. She, she really puts the boot into uh poets and writers in general and people and and it's just a nice little 
crime story too. It's a real detective story, mm. real gumshoe detective story at its heart. So yeah, that's what I've been writing, yeah. um, reading. No, thanks. And then, thanks for sharing those. Yeah, yeah. Um, Kelly's wondering if you do have a favourite author. No, no. Um, I have lots of favourites. Um, mm. But it depends what day, yeah. what mood, mm. um, where I'm in my own writing. I mean, I could rattle off a whole lot of favourites. Uh, so, okay, I, I love Elizabeth Stroud, American writer, not a crime writer, love her sparsity. Not all her books, but um, all of Kitty Rich and My Name is Lucy Barton, things like that. Mm. I love um, people like Rachel Cusk. Again, a very, very different writer from her. She's very cool, distant writer, UK writer, people like Hilary Mantel, who wrote uh, Wolf Hall. And then for the crime, you know, you've got, you've got the classics um, and all the US classics, Elmore, Leonard, and people mm -hmm. like that. Um, Peter Temple here, Eva Clifford, uh, Jock Sarong. Mm. Uh, although he's not writing so much crime, these days, but his uh, Rules for Backyard Cr Cricket is one of my, my favourite all-time books. I, I I really love it. It's, it's a great examination of, of uh, sibling rivalry. And um, he understands that, yeah, that, that love-hate push-pull against things. And don't be put off by the word, word cricket in the title. It, it's got a lot of cricket in it, but it, it but like me, I, I don't understand cricket. <laughs> I really enjoy it. <laughs> Mm. No, thanks for that. And um, when you start writing your books, do you know the ending before you start? No. So how I know nothing. You, <laughs> what do you usually start off with? I usually start off with a scene. Uh, and if I'm really lucky, I've got a few scenes and I use them as signposts that I, I write towards. So I don't pre-plot. Um, I, I write just, you know, it's called pantsing. I just mm. start writing. Mm. Um, if I'm really lucky, that that central scene that's in my brain is actually the opening scene. Um, so with Resurrection Bay, I knew that Caleb was there holding his dead mate and mm. went from there. Although funnily enough, in my mind, that wasn't the opening scene of the book. That was like 20,000 words into it. Um, and <laughs> which I wrote, it was one of those um, terrible and also wonderful moments when I realized that I had written 20,000 words before the book actually said, oh, the book starts there, not there. And I had yeah. to delete in like one swipe. Oh. Um, so learning where that opening chapter is, it's, it's a bit of a, it's, yeah. it's a bit of a skill. I think it comes and goes. Yeah. So I write from scene to scene um, mm. and I write in all directions as well, backwards, forwards, sideways. Mm. Um, it, it's a bit of a mess really until the end and I sort of bring it all together. Yeah. Um, what would you, what do you think readers will love about your books? Uh, I hope, <laughs> I really hope they, they, I really hope they love the characters. Yeah. You don't have to like them all, but you know how when you're drawn to some characters that you just need to know more about them and get mm. to, to know them. Um, I really hope that they want to follow Caleb's adventures and, are, and are sort of rooting for him as they go. Might get angry mm. with him sometimes. I mean, God knows I do. Um, but to be really just invested and excited and and moved by yeah. their stories, yeah. yeah. Mm. And are you still um, in your musical career as well? Uh, yes and no. So I was sort of petering off mm. playing professionally. There's just not enough hours in the day. Like you know, you got to practice three hours a day and then mm. do rehearsals and this is not. Mm. So that was becoming less and less. And I, I sort of I made like a decision. Maybe it's probably two years ago now. I went. No, it's yeah. a, it's, <laughs> I need to do one. Um, but I, I do still teach a bit. Um, so okay. that keeps yeah. my hand in really. Mm. It's, so it's not totally, totally dropped. Mm. Mm. And like, it sounds like you're actually, when you're actually writing, you don't have a structure in your writing, but when you, during your day, do you set aside time for writing or have some structure in your yeah, well, again, it depends where I am in the writing um, of it. Mm. So at the moment, I'm editing, and my edits are due in, in about a week. Um, she says casually, it's actually 10 days exactly. <laughs> um, I write all day. I get mm, up, no, I, I write. Um, I'll, I'll have a couple of quick breaks. I will write. I'll suddenly realise it's 2 a.m. I'll make myself go to bed. <laughs> well, I'll get up, yeah. and I'll just, you know. Mm. At the beginning of a book, 
when it's a blank page, um, that's really hard. And that's when I set myself goals mm. and I tend to set um, time rather than word okay, goals. Yeah. Mm. So I'll say, all right, so um, you just got to sit down and write for four hours today. Mm -hmm. And if possible, I make myself walk somewhere else to write and walk back because that walking helps the ideas flow. If there's no ideas, sitting at a computer is like, it's the worst place yeah. for most people to be. You're just sitting there going, oh, God, what am I going to do? So yeah, some strict time, time allowances there. Yeah. yeah. And Kelly also mentioned that she's definitely drawn to your characters and love how you get to know them throughout the book. Oh, that's great, Kelly. I'm so mm. glad. Yeah. I mean, that, that's what I love about writing and reading myself. Mm. Um, so, um, look, some people just read them for like a fast, entertaining, you know, plot because mm. there's a lot of plot in them. And that's great. I mean, mm. if they, if they, if that, they're just getting some hours out of this, you know, the horrible state of the world, man, fantastic. But I know as a reader, I like to really go on the, the, right, the, the character's journey yeah. myself. Mm -hmm. And you said that you're nearing the end of the deadline for your book. Is that the fourth book in your series? Or? Yeah, that's yeah. Those Who Perish, um, yeah. which will be out next year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And are you already thinking of what you're going to be writing next? Yeah, I, I've got an idea that's um, it's been coming and going for about 10 years now. Mm. Um, and it's a standalone, I think. Could be a short series. Another let's, crime let's, novel. Let's, let's, yeah, so it, it'll be a bit different. Uh, I don't want to say too much about it, um, but it will, if I do the one I'm thinking of, because I do have a couple of ideas, but the main one I'm thinking of uh, will be crime, um, but it will be a bit different. It will be historical mm, okay. um, and a little bit based on some family history. Um, but I'm sort of, it's one of those ideas that keeps coming back and keeps coming back. So I think it probably will be the next one. And if the borders open for me, I will be going off and doing some research um, on that in, in a few weeks. Okay. So mm. fingers crossed. Yeah. Mm. Well, good luck with being able mm. to do that. Leave <laughs> Melbourne. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Unique experience. Yeah. yeah. And how have you gone with um, promoting your books during these last like year or so? Yeah, it's been really interesting. I had a lot of festivals lined up for mm -hmm. last year because um, mm -hmm. Darkness for Light came out in December. So, you know, the big, the whole year was meant to be um, December nine, uh, 2019. Oh, yeah. So 2020 was meant to be like a year of festivals, had heaps lined up internationally and nationally. Um, half of them cancelled instantly. They were gone. Mm -hmm. The ones that went online were great and, and were really interesting and incredibly well attended because... Um, particularly the rural ones, they were getting people around Australia and, and internationally watching them. So they were, they were really lovely. Um, mm. But a lot of work for the organisers mm. to, to suddenly pivot from doing, you know, a live thing to an online thing, I yeah. think was really, really hard. Mm. I think people are getting really great at it now. I mean, mm. everyone's... With all the words that we didn't know before, you know, what's Zoom? What's a ring light? I don't know. What's an internet? So we've got it all down now. Yeah, yeah. And have you found that you've been able, like, being able to reach more people with doing a lot yeah. more online? Or I think it swings and roundabouts with that one yeah. because there is nothing like um, being live and making that actual connection. Mm. And and maybe it's an audience you're on a panel and and they've come to hear someone else on the panel, but you make that connection and they realise that you're writing the sort of books that they might enjoy. Mm. Might be something different mm. that they, you know, haven't read before. And 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 that is something you, you can't, um, you don't get that casual, um, yeah, meeting of, of minds mm. really. But it's definitely bringing it wider. Like, so, uh, you know, sitting in Melbourne, I can be talking to someone in Darwin or mm. uh, London often, mm. you know, I've done quite a few things in Arizona, mm. I mean, online, actually live too, but it's that when it was live, I had to get on a plane, yeah. go to America, yeah. you know, go, go to Arizona, drive mm. to the bookshop, whereas Zoom, it's like you're there. So th I think there's some real positives there as, mm. as well as the negatives. Mm. And have you got any live... Um, appearances scheduled for later this year that's a good question um i don't know mm. i don't think so. mm, i 
think uh, in in fourth term, um, yes, but not nothing lies nothing in the so, next little while, yeah. uh, which is probably just as well because we keep going into lockdown. Yeah. So um, mm. it's you know, <laughs> yeah. Mm. Well, thanks so much for talking to me. Been great talking to you. Been a pleasure, Jackie. Thank you. <laughs> Do you want to let people know how they can keep in touch with you? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I do have a Facebook author page. Um, I'm very slack on it, though. See, <laughs> do update it. Uh, if you ever want to chat, I am on Twitter, uh, Emma Viskich, at Emma Viskich, um, or email me. Um, so I've, I've got a web page. If you just Google, it'll it'll mm. come up with a with an email thing. Mm. But yeah, I chat I chat a lot on Twitter. Um, definitely not when I'm meant to be working. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thanks so much and um, yeah, look forward to reading more of your books and hopefully My we pleasure. get a chance to talk to you another time. It'd be lovely. Thanks, Thank Jackie. you and thanks for everyone who joined on. Bye. Bye. <laughs>